there were a couple of comments on yesterday's video that actually had nothing at all to do with the content of yesterday's video, but more something that I mentioned towards the end. And both of these comments were well-meaning comments. I thought we should address, I, I think it's important to go over these things, just so that terms are understood. So the one of them was having to do with the fact that on this 361 that I'm putting together, this is a mule engine. We've talked about this, and I'll go into this, I'll go into this in, in more depth soon. I mentioned towards the end of yesterday's video that I have a factory four barrel intake manifold that I'm going to blueprint for this engine. And the first comment that popped up was, why would you use a stock intake manifold? Why wouldn't you just put an aluminum intake? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Why wouldn't you just put a high performance aluminum intake manifold on it instead of working with the stock piece? And this is the manifold that I'm talking about here. So this is, it's, this is a 70, 72 400 intake manifold. They actually, it's actually a very good intake. Actually, Chrysler back in the day used to recommend upgrading the earlier 68 through 70 or 71 um, manifold with these and then using an adapter to go to a square bore carb. Or you could have used a thermal quad too. But this was actually recommended by Chrysler back in the day. So there's a 72, 73 intake manifold. It has the EGR provision, but it doesn't have, didn't come with the actual EGR valve. So at any rate, and the Edelbrock Performer is very similar, I mean, extremely similar to this. But to, to more directly to answer the question, why would I do that intake manifold instead of an aftermarket aluminum one? It's because, and I, I listed several reasons in, in a, so I responded to it. I listed several reasons and I pinned it also. But again, like to paraphrase myself, it was because A, not everybody has an aluminum intake manifold. B, not everybody can afford an aluminum intake manifold. C, some people are working with engines that just do not have aluminum intake manifolds available to them, high performance manifolds available. I, I mean, I, I just kept going with this because remember when we do stuff on this channel, we're not a Mopar channel. I'm not building specifically Mopar cars. I use the Chrysler products that I'm familiar with, that I work with, that I have on hand as examples. And I try to make it as broad as possible. So that somebody who's watching these videos and they're working with, let's say, a, uh, oh, I don't know, a, a, a 69 Caddy and, and parts just aren't available, but he still wants to maximize things. He can take the information that he gets from here that I use Chrysler's to illustrate and apply it to his application. Almost all of the, the technical videos we do are universal in that respect. So there are many reasons why I'm using a stock intake manifold. I have aluminum intake manifolds, obviously. I've got aluminum intake manifolds for low deck Chrysler's. But I want to use this one as an example of what can be done with a stock intake manifold. And then later on, we will swap it out and compare the stock intake manifold to aftermarket manifolds. And that's the whole purpose of this mule. The idea is to be able to swap parts in and out of it and test different ideas and concepts and theories and so on and so forth on an engine that's moderately sized and very representative of the typical hot rod engine. So yes, it's a 361 Chrysler, but it could very easily be a 351 Ford. It could very easily be a Winter, right? It could very easily be a 350 Chevy or a 350 Olds or a 350 Buick. This engine, the whole purpose of this engine is to be representative of a typical V8, middle-sized V8 engine using the basic old-school kind of muscle car technology that we like. You know? All things, every kind of thing you can imagine will eventually find its way onto this engine, including fuel injection. So we can do back-to-back, -back, all different ignition systems I want to test on this. It's all down the road. I, the first step was to actually build the engine that we're going to do that with. Now we get the car over here. We're going to start working on the car. And the whole purpose of the car is to be a mule so that things and, and concepts can be tested on it. It's, it's just another way of making content is what it is. So at any rate, that's the answer to that. Not everybody has one. Not everybody can afford one. Not everybody wants one. There's a sleeper effect. There is the originality effect. 
right? There's, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to mess around with a stock intake manifold. And we're going to go through this one and we're going to blueprint it. So that brings us to the second term that some controversy. So in the comments, there was a, a gentleman who's an, a race engine builder from Australia. And he mentioned that I can't blueprint in a, any part by grinding on it or by modifying it. And I have to disagree with him. The term blueprinting is very loosely used. It's very, it's, it's, it's one of the most misunderstood words in the, the realm of hot rodding. Balanced and blueprinted, Every, that was the thing. Oh, it's balanced and blueprinted. Everybody kind of knows what balancing means, but nobody really knows what blueprinting means. And the simple explanation of it is that blueprinting is taking a production part, something that came up the assembly line, and helping it fit the engineer's original intent, the designer's original intent. Because between the idea and the drawings and, and the science, between that and reality is the production process. And the production process means that not so much that, that corners get cut, but tolerances aren't what they should be. Um, like for instance, when an engineer draws out a cylinder head and he draws out a port, he's not drawing out the little lumps that are in there and, and casting imperfections. And he, he's, not, he's, he's drawing it out as a perfect part, as a perfect, you know, an idealized part. And then it gets transferred to production. Well, the process of blueprinting is to take that part that has all of those production uh, tolerances or, or, or uh, production slop and remove the slop and try to make it as close to what the engineer originally intended. And that's what we're going to do with this intake manifold. It's as simple as that. Like for instance, well, you know what? I don't want to go too into it because I want to show the exact details exactly what we're going to do. And it's a simple process. It's not a big deal. It's not very involved. But things like gasket matching are part of it. You know, the when the engineer drew out, the designer drew out that intake manifold, he wasn't taking into, he wasn't uh, including ports, there are rectangular ports, but they're not really rectangles. They're kind of tall on the top and short on the bottom. They're, they're a little bit higher or, or a little bit lower. It just depends on how the cores were laid out as, as this thing was being manufactured. When, when they, like for, go back to the cylinder head, for example, when they lay out the bowls, they're not intending for the area under the valve to be misshapen and not quite what it's supposed to be. They're not taking into account that the way a head is cast, especially these Chrysler heads, where there's an upper or a lower half, that the cores shift and there's going to be a ridge all the way around the bowl inside there. That's going to catch air. It's going to, it's going to knock fuel out of suspension. It's going to disturb exhaust flow. So the process of blueprinting doesn't only have to do with, let's say, making every piston weigh exactly what it's supposed to weigh and every tolerance and every clearance making those things exactly what they're supposed to be and making the deck height exactly what it's supposed to be. Those are all blueprinting practices and, and they're valid. They add up to power, but it also includes cast parts that are sloppy and not up to spec, not what the designer had in mind when he drew it out. So that's blueprinting. So I'll give you an example of blueprinting, right? And you got to go way back to this. You got to go back to like 1969, I guess it was, or thereabouts. Okay, the muscle car era. You always had what they called, quote, ringers. So in other words, let's just say you're talking about a 69 Roadrunner, a, a 69 Roadrunner 383 car. Now, the typical 69 Roadrunner 383 car you would go to the dealership, 33 four-speed, let's just say, and moderately optioned, you know, 323 gear and, and, you know, moderately optioned, typically optioned. You go to the dealership, you buy this thing, you take it right to the drag strip, it goes 15-0, right? Okay, now you make a few more runs with it, you, you get used to driving the car, and it, things to break, start to break in, and the engine really starts to seal a little bit better, and you get the hang of it, and now the car is running like 14-7s, 14-6s, and that's pretty strong. And then you'll have one, same guy will go and he'll buy same exact car, option the same way. And his will run like 14.7 is right off the bat. 
and then he'll he'll finesse it a little bit and go like 1450s or 1440s without adding any parts. I'm talking about just a stock car. Why the difference? Why the disparity in performance between those two cars? Well, one of them was built, or the parts were cast, let's say, with just a higher level of adherence to the original design. So the cores for those heads on the stronger engine were laid out just a little bit more carefully. And so the bowls are a little more uniform and smooth. And so it'll make just that extra 10 horsepower, 15 horsepower that makes the difference and makes it go. Or it could be that the slower one just had a set of really sloppy cast heads and a sloppy cast intake manifold. And it's a couple of cylinders are getting washed with gas because it pulls out of suspension because of the bumps and the ridges and the things. And it, okay. So then you talk about now, you go, the, go one step further, and you go to the hand-built cars. So back in the day, they used to, the, the manufacturers had press cars that they would use, they would hand out to, to certain magazines or, or, or testers. And you had the, like, you'd have like Ronnie Socks takes the 69 Roadrunner, you know, and, and goes 1395 with it or 1372, whatever, whatever numbers. But it would be like ridiculously fast. And you say, well, how in God's name did Ronnie Socks go that fast with this car? And it wasn't because Ronnie Socks could drive it. Now, yeah, Ronnie Socks could shift for sure, right? And I'm sure he knew how to work a clutch. But it, it, Ronnie Socks couldn't, he, he wasn't a wizard that could bend time and space. You can only do so much with what you've got. The difference was that the cars that were given and used in those examples were literally hand built. So from front to back, Every single aspect of that car was maximized. It had all of the stock parts. It had everything you know that it was born with, or should have been born with, but everything was just exactly so. And when you take that approach and you go from the front bumper to the back bumper of the car and the roof to the, to the bottom of the tires and you make everything exactly the way it's supposed to be, you can get astounding performance out of an otherwise mediocre car. That is what blueprinting is about. Blueprinting is not just about the engine. It's not just about the, the specifications, the clearances, and, and whatnot of the engine. Blueprinting is a process that you can take through the entire car, front to back, and maximize every single aspect of it to be the best part that it can be. And this is, if, you, if you're into like stocker type of muscle cars, you know, um, you don't, you, don't, you don't want headers on the thing. You don't want an intake manifold. You know, you, you open the hood, you want it to look all stock. You don't want a lumpy, lumpy cam, but you want the car to run respectably. You want it to run good. Well, this is how you do it. And it's not just muscle cars, it's any car. You could take any car, because all of those cars have, have um, what, what's, what's that word, uh, stacked, stacked clearances. You know what I mean? Where, where this is off by a hundred, this is off by a thousand, this is off by three thousand, this is off by, and then before you know it, you've got these big, gaps in what should be versus what actually is. Well, by taking a car and going front to back and making everything exactly the way it was intended to be, you know, with the eye towards performance, you can do amazing things. So that's my answer to that one as far as the blueprinting goes. Uh, I, I think I'm rambling on again, right? But you know, this is the kind of thing that you, know, you got to talk about. You got to talk about because you know, this is the science of working with cars, of improving cars, making them faster, making them more efficient, making them more fun, making them last longer, making them do all of the things to the best of their ability. That's, that's where I get my kicks. And, I, and I, I, I'm sure that's where most of you guys, if you're watching this channel for any amount of time, I'm sure that you see things pretty much the same way. That's it, guys. I'll see you tomorrow.